Fantastic. All right, yeah, you guys grab a seat. I'm excited for this word today. I'm excited. We had two good weeks. We had Pastor Sunny two weeks ago. She was fantastic. She had the fire on the stage, literally had the fire on the stage, which all the staff knows there's no fire allowed on the stage when I'm in town. But when I leave town, you know, Pastor Sunny just does whatever she wants. Uh, let's be honest. She does whatever she wants anyway. Uh, and then we had Pastor Fillmore last week. He preached two messages last week. So if you came to the first service and thought you heard it all, I, I thought the first message, if you came to second service, I'll tell you, the first message, you you've got to listen to that. It was a great deposit for your year. The second message was equally valuable. He um, expounded on uh, lots of things, but one of the things that really struck me, just so you know, I listened and I'm not just throwing uh, encouragements out there. He um, gave one of the best descriptions of the fear of the Lord that I've ever heard, which sounds like, I don't want to listen to that, the fear of the Lord, I'm not into that. No, no, it was fantastic, especially if you feel that way, like you don't want to listen to it because I just said that. It's a great one for you to listen to. Um, today, I want to leverage where we've been going. I want to leverage, I listened to Pastor Sonny's message this week, um, and it was fantastic. I want to leverage the idea that we're moving into 2024 with a specific kind of word in our heart. And so before I get started on my message, I just want to encourage you. One of the things that I find in my Christian walk that I have to re-imagine um, all the time, I have to kind of remember all the time, is that there are no words. There is no imagery. There's no painting. There's no book. There's no friend that can explain to you the glory and majesty of God. It, it, it cannot be done. We do not have the words to convey the majesty. That's why I think sometimes in the Psalms, it says, oh God, because <laughs> he's just like, oh, I, I got nothing else. Like all I can do is give you this expression of my imagination because truly God is breathtaking. I mean, when we see, I talk about this every Christmas, but when we see in scripture, anyone coming into to an encounter with an angel of the Lord or an encounter with the presence of God, usually their response is fear. Not because God is at nature to be feared, but because his presence is so awesome, which is a well, well overused word, but so awe-inspiring. We're so in awe. We cannot speak. We cannot move. We just are, are so aware of our own shortcomings and his awesome majesty that we cannot express ourselves. And I think as we move into 2024, we have to remember that. And what happens when we, when we can't express ourselves is we tend to use metaphors, which is a crazy kind of human idea that we can describe one thing by using something else. And we use metaphors all the time in, in everyday life. They use them in advertising all the time. If you talk about, you know, I own a Chevy. Why? Because it's the heartbeat of America. Is Chevrolet really the heartbeat of this country? No. But, but they want you to feel like if I own a Chevrolet, I'm, I'm actually, I'm more patriotic. I'm more part of this country. I am, I'm a part of what's going on. Or maybe you, you're, you're, you're a Red Bull fan. Red Bull gives you wings. Do you drink a Red Bull and then all of a sudden out of your back, these wings start to kind of spread? No, no, it just gives you tons of energy. So they, don't, they can't describe that quite right. But so they go, well, what happens when I have Red Bull is it, it kind of gives you wings. Pastor Sarah, she loves Stanley Cups, right, Angela? <laughs> Pastor Sarah loves her Stanley Cup. Anybody like a Stanley Cup, good Stanley Cup? Come on, there's some closet Stanley Cup drinkers in here. You are not raising your hand. It's okay. There's nothing wrong. It's not an addiction. Well, it's kind of an addiction. It's okay. If you ask Pastor Sarah, do you like your Stanley Cup? She won't just say, yeah, it's a really good cup. She'll say, every time I reach into my cabinet and pull out my Stanley Cup, she'll say, it's like that final piece of the thousand piece jigsaw puzzle that you put into place. Should every morning when that happens, when I pull out that cup, it's like my life is completed by that Stanley Cup. Skittles, taste the rainbow. Is it actually tasting a rainbow, John? John, you're the flavor scientist. No, it's not actually tasting a rainbow, right? The cherry probably doesn't even really taste like cherry. It tastes like what they want you to think cherry tastes like, whatever makes you come back for more. But the, the metaphors are able to describe because truthfully, if you taste all of the Skittles at once, which is my favorite way to taste Skittles, you taste all the Skittles at once, you won't be able to describe the flavor accurately. And, and truthfully, a lot of times when you taste a grape Jolly Rancher or something, it doesn't taste like a grape, right? It tastes actually like a whole different kind of sugary grape. But in the same way, we have a really hard time explaining and conveying, not only to other people, but to ourselves, 
the majesty and the goodness of God. And truthfully, the, 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 the biblical writers have the same problem because it's not, it's not my lack of education or my lack of knowledge. It's simply the awesome nature of God that, that means that the, the, the Hebrew words can't do it, the Greek words can't do it, the English words can't do it. We can't convey to you the awesome majesty of God, and we need to know that because God is bigger than we can imagine he is. His goodness is greater than the goodness you can ever imagine. And his plans and his purposes for you. This is why 2024 just gets so relevant. His plans and his purposes for you are far better than anything you can conceive of. Do you know what we do? Well, we got a couple, we got a couple of things. But you know what we do? We think of blessing, and the first thing we think about is money. And I just think God has such a better such a more holistic, such a more elevated plan for your life than to consider money the first, second, third, or fourth priority. I mean, if God wants to give me $100,000, I will receive it. But I don't think that's his best for my life. Because if you've got a bad health report, the money doesn't make as much difference, does it? If your relationships are in trouble, the money doesn't mean as much as it used to. Like, like money sounds good when everything else is good, but when something else is bad, there's a lot of things that will, will pop up over that money thing. But when we think blessing, the first thing we think about is money. But God's ways, God's ability, God's reality is so much bigger than that. So when we come into our 2024 and we're setting goals and we're setting priorities and we're looking to the future and we're just naturally in the season of our year where we're dreaming about what's next for our lives, I, today I just want you to open up your minds a little bit to the possibilities. Open up your minds a little bit to the, to, the, to, the, to the promises of God and the possibilities of God, not just for your friends and your neighbors, not just for your church, although please do that with us too as we build that building out there. Like We have to imagine now what that looks like because we don't know. So we imagine it and then we tell a contractor who tells a subcontractor who tells a supplier what we want that to look like. Our imagination is made manifest on the other side of that wall as we communicate. Yeah. And I think in lots of ways God's plan is the same. We read it on paper and we get it into our heads but then we have to start communicating it. Because I'll tell you the world won't communicate it to you. My wife is one of the best people in the world at this. Pastor Sarah, since I just used her as a, as a funny metaphor example, I thought it was funny at least. Not many people laughed. I thought it was funny. <laughs> She's fantastic at this too. They have enough word of God in them that when they encounter adversity in other people's lives, they can counter what the world is doing to them with the word of God. So you can say, I know what's going on with you, but God says this. I know what's happening in your world, but God knows this. I know how it feels right now, but the truth is God is with you. And so today, my whole goal is to implant that deeply on the inside of you from the word of God so that when you leave here, your shoulders just get a little bit farther back. Your eyes just get a little bit more lifted. Your mind is just a little more convinced that the God that we serve, listen, this is, this is what I want you to know, has a plan and purpose for you that's better than anything you could have asked or imagined possible. Not my idea, God's word. That the, word, the salvation he has for you, the life he has for you, the plans he has for you are better, listen, better than anything you could imagine. So the, the lie of scripture, sorry, the lie in scripture comes in Genesis, comes in lots of places where the devil comes to Adam and Eve and what did he say? He said, did God really say yeah. you couldn't eat of any of the trees of the garden? Actually, no, no devil. He never said that. But what's the devil trying to do? He's trying to say, did God really take away all your joy? Did God really take away all your potential? No, no, he just doesn't want you to have the best. Gillette, the best a man can get. Man, if that were true, I would be done. I got a Gillette, check and check. I got the shaving cream and the razor, nailed it. The problem is, it's a little bit of hyperbole that Gillette is the best a man can get. 
When Sonny says, Jeff, I'm really disappointed, you say, ah. Hold on. <laughs> the best a man can get. No, no. But don't let the lie of advertising, don't let the lie of the marketing of the world try to take away from you the reality the word of God is true and the word of God is right. So let's, let's turn together to Psalm 139, which we've been talking about for the last few weeks, kind of just in, in fits and starts in these messages. And I think God is doing something. Pastor Joe said, I think last week, she said, I don't think it's coincidence. I think it's providence that God is bringing the scripture back and back and back in so many places and meetings and, and conversations around the church lately. I want to walk you through this and show you what David is doing in Psalm 139. David, a man whose heart is after God. We know that David is, is an example all the time of what it means to try to express the goodness and the purposes of God. And so this is what David says. I'm going I'm to break this scripture down into a couple different parts because that's how it's broken down in the word. So I'm going to start with the first six verses. Here we go. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, say this in the NIV. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So look at that verse six. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Now it doesn't mean that the knowledge is too good, although that's true as well. When he says wonderful, it's like wonderful, like, like there's too much goodness for me to even comprehend. Too lofty, I can't even get to all the goodness. I can't get to all your thoughts about me. I can't get to under all the understanding of, of how you imagine all that I could be. God, all of this is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. But you think about this scripture, what he's saying in these verses. He's saying, Lord, when I get up and when I lay down, you're there. When I go out and I come back, you're there. He says, you hem me in. What does that mean? It's like, you've cornered me. You've hemmed me in. So this is, and I don't think the psalmist really gives us a clear picture. I don't think David, who's who's attributed this psalm to, I don't think David really gives us a clear picture of whether he's excited or scared. (laughs) Because it's like, if you're hemmed in, by the right person, and you're in good shape, and you're with, if Walker, who's very quick, I've played tennis with Walker, he's incredible, I know he looks quick, he's quicker than that. If Walker hems you in, you're not getting out. So if Walker's happy with you, and Walker's trying to bless you, fantastic. You're, you're okay to be hemmed in. If Walker's mad at you, you're not as happy to be hemmed in. Right? Walker has two kids under the age of three. Two, under the age of two, oh, Gosh, good luck hemming those guys in. But you hem your kids in when, they, when they're in trouble, they're like looking for a way out because they know what's coming. You hem your kids in and they know they're going to get ice cream, they're going to come running right towards you. Right. Yeah, exactly. The psalmist here doesn't tell us exactly which way it is. All he says is, no matter what I do, no matter where I go, and all these verbs are God verbs. God, you Search me. God, you know me. God, you perceive. God, you discern. God, you him. God, you lay your hand upon me. If Walker's kids are in trouble and he lays their hand upon them, that can be two different kinds of hand, can it? So in this first section, the psalmist is conveying the, the awesome omnipresence of God in our lives, good or bad, faithful or unfaithful right or wrong, God is there. So then verses 7 through 12, the second stanza kind of of this poetic psalm, he says it it turns to I verbs. These are things now I do. Now I know who God is. Now what's my reaction? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, (laughs) you're there. If If I make my bed in the depths, which really is like Sheol, which is like hell, if I make my bed in, in the bad places, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle, there's your, there's your metaphor right there, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, you're not really going to do that, but if you rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, does that mean like 
he's trying to hide? Or does that mean like my life has gotten so dark that God can't even help me anymore? Is it a positive affirmation or a negative? It's not clear, but that's the beauty of Scripture. Because in either situation, Tommy, in either situation, God is right there with you. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So what's the psalmist doing now? So he goes, I know that God's with me all the time. He's either saying, and and you could say either one to yourself in 2024, I want to point you in the right direction this morning. You could say, well, I know, I know that God is with me all the time, so I'm going to do my best to hide my stuff from him. We think we can do that, don't we? Like, I think I, what happens in my house, I don't know about you, LeVar. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to talk about Kevin because he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a deep offender. But what happens is, is between meals sometimes, I walk into the closet, the pantry, and there's some kind of like a, there's a whole safe zone there where no one can know what happens in the pantry. And I reach up for the Cool Ranch Doritos and I start unfolding the Cool Ranch Doritos, and it doesn't matter where I am in the house, Sonny can hear the wrapper for the Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> Dinner's going to be ready in 15 minutes. She doesn't directly approach me. She has grace for me, and she just lets me know that like, there's no snacking in between meals, except when I'm in the closet, there are no calories. When I'm in the closet, it's all okay. Right, Calvin? When you're in the closet, it's all good. Like, I think I can hide from her. I think I can hide my, but God knows everything. He's everywhere. Where can I go? It's either a positive affirmation, God, no matter what happens this year, I know you're with me. Or a negative affirmation. I'm, I, don't, I don't feel like this is going to go well with God, so I've got to get out of here. Where can I go? What can I do? But I want you to see the positive affirmation this morning. The psalmist is saying, it doesn't matter what happens in your life. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter if you read your Bible this morning. It doesn't matter if you join the gym on January 1st and you've already stopped going. It doesn't matter if you, if you said, I'm going to lose 30 pounds in 30 days and you've already gone 30 pounds in the other direction. It doesn't matter. God is still with you. You can't escape him. But the lie of our self esteem, the lie of our self-consciousness, the lie of our reality that's on the inside of every human being is we think, well, we have messed up, so God doesn't want us anymore. And the psalm is saying, among other things, the psalm is saying to you, listen, today, right now, in this place, where you sit, how you sit, the condition of your heart, the, the knowledge in your head, all of that. God is right there with you. He's got you hemmed in. And he's got his hand on your head. And he wants to bless you. That's who he is. But it says, I go, I flee. I say to myself, surely the darkness will hide me. Surely my faithlessness, God doesn't want me anymore. Surely I haven't been in church in a couple of years. He's not going to, pastor doesn't know what's going on with me. He's, he's not talking to me. Surely he doesn't know the thoughts that I have going on in the inside of my head. He doesn't know what I said to my wife yesterday. He doesn't know about my blank, 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 whatever it is for you. Surely the darkness in my life is going to hide me from all the good things of God. No, 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 no. Don't let the lie penetrate the truth. Don't let the lie deceive you from believing that the God who created you desires to bless you and your household today. Psalm 139 verse 13. For you created the very beginning before anything else. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now the intimacy, it was all God's action. It was all my action. Now it's together. Now he's coming together. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How much 
I'm going to keep going. How much does he care for you? How much does he love you? That, it, that all of the details matter to him. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. They would outnumber. Have you just been to one beach? Have you been to two beaches? Have you been to Hawaii where it's beach all the way around? Like they outnumber the grains of sand. Yes, it's a metaphor, but I don't think it's hyperbole. Yes, it's a, his, his thoughts are not actually grains of sand, but they're like in number the, number, the grains of sand on the earth. How wonderful are your thoughts about me? We think, well, we can write down some, so Pastor Joe did an exercise with us this week, and she said, write down some identity statements. I wrote down about 60. And I got I, about 60. I was like, I don't, I'm getting running out here. But God's not me. When God sees me, He's like AI. He's just generating this list. Except he's not A, he's just I. Were I to count them, were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand, which means if you were to count them, you would never finish. Chuck Dameron, one of the smartest guys I know, invented the MRI or something like that. Even he couldn't count. All the good thoughts that God has about him, let alone Barbara. And then next, Psalm 139, verse 19. This is where it gets weird. You ready? This is, the, the Bible always confounds me at some point. So here it goes. Here it gets weird. Everything changes now. Here it goes. And if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Where did that come from? We're talking about his goodness and his, his wholeness and his thoughts about me. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. That language wasn't there before. And they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate, hate, hate? Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred. Man, this is an intense verse. If you read this before and you were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, stop. This is intense. I count them my enemies. Listen, what he's saying here is, I know who you are, God, and I know who I am, and now, God, look at my surroundings. God, look at what my circumstances are telling me. God, look at what the, the, the fallen world is doing to my soul. God, look at what all the adversity I'm, I'm facing. And you know, for David, this was a reality in parts of his life, and it was a, a mental check in other parts of his life. For David, the whole nation was seeking him out to kill him. He had the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. He had everybody of his time coming to find him and, and, and remove him from the world. Take his life away from him. Not only that, but he had temptations on every side. David is the hottest and coldest we get. David is the, is the, is the, the hyperbole of biblical characters. So he said, I, I've seen who you are, God, and I've, I've seen who I am, and now I see all that's around me. He says, I don't want anything that's not of you. I've seen it all. I don't want anything that's not of you. So here's, here's where our scripture comes in today. Here's where our, our, our crescendo is today. Verse 23, so... Because I know you and I know what's around me. I know what knocks on the door of my heart. I know what knocks on the door of my mind. So instead, Father, I need you. I know you're here. I know all the darkness hasn't hidden me. I know I haven't walked too far away. I know I got back to church this morning. Listen, I've said this probably 10 times in the last three months, but I'm just telling you again, you sitting in that chair today is a miracle. God took every decision of your grandparents, your parents, of generations of people. They got you in this city, in this place, in this time, and all the decisions, all the words spoken over you, all the food that you ate, everything. Somehow, today, in your mind, God, I'm going to go to the early service at C3 Church. And you sat here, and this word met your ears, and this word gets into your heart. And you know full well that something's not right on the inside of you. You know full well when you the promises of God that there's a discrepancy. You see his goodness and you see what happens in your life day to day and you go, something's not right. Not only not right in my heart, 
but something's not right in all hearts. The world is a broken place. And your neighbors will say, well, that's why I don't believe in God, because the world is so messed up. No, no, that's why I believe in God. Because he tells me, before I even realized it, how corrupted the world is. So the psalmist ends this exploration with these words, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in, in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When Pastor Sonny was reading this part of the scripture in her message, she started weeping. Because when you think about the fullness of the God we described in the first six verses, searching your heart, every deep place, every website that you didn't want to click on but you clicked, every word that you spoke about a friend or a loved one that you wish you could reel back into your world, every post that you secretly went like, every attitude, every envy, every sees it all. And his desire is to lay his hand upon your head and redeem it all. He wants to pick you up, pull you in, and set you right again. How good is that relationship? The strange turn takes us into the reality of what we need today. The strange turn there at the end, that last stanza, starts talking about hate and violence. It takes us into the turn that says, God, now I know. I know why you need to be with me all the time. I know why I need you in my life. I know why. I can't do this on my own. God, I know why. So search me. So have your way. So I surrender to you again so that you might become who you are in my world. And listen. You can't ever know how good he is, not just in the world, but how good he desires to be in your world. Just in the Gospel of John, this is who Jesus says he is. Just in the Gospel of John, he has these I am statements, and he says this. He says, I am the bread of life. Is he actually bread? No, no, he's not actually bread, but he's the sustenance by which we can have life. I am the light of the world. Is he actually light? He's not actually light. He's actually the light by which we see all things and can discern all things and can know all things. He is the truth revealed to us. I am the gate for the sheep. He is the one who wants to let us in to all of the fullness, all of the glory, all of the joy, all of the fulfillment that's possible with one who is created and called his son or his daughter. I am the good shepherd. What does that mean? It means I've got authority over you and I want to lead you in the right direction. I am the resurrection. I, listen, I know that those places in your heart have died. I know there's disappointments. I know there's insecurities. I know there's all those things, but I am the resurrection. I can bring them back to life again, like CPR in your soul. I can pump those things into your chest as you read my word, as you get into my community, as you pray those prayers. I want to meet you in that space so that... You can have the life again. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Talked about those last January. I am the true vine. What does that mean? The vine is the vessel that brings all the nutrients, all the resource, all the life into the extended parts of the plant. He's saying, if you'll let me connect to me, I will bring you all that you need to live a full and abundant life. John's not the only one. There's other descriptions. I can't even list them all. But here's some other descriptions to who God is in the world. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. There is, you cannot get apart from me. You cannot get before me. You cannot get after me. I am here for the long haul. I am the first and the last. I am the bright morning star. When you get up, he is ready for you. I am the rock. I am the rock. I'm not the shifting sand. I'm not the unreliable one. 
I'm not one way yesterday and a different way tomorrow. The truth that Pastor Jeff is telling you today is the truth that I will be for the remainder of eternity. I will always love you. I will always desire you. I want a relationship with you. I am the cornerstone. I am the head of the church. I'm the author and perfecter of your faith. If we will, if we will give our lives into his hands today, I think Pastor Sonny's nailed it. I think Pastor Sonny has nailed it. Okay. What happens to me, I don't know if it happens to you. What happens to me is I go, okay, I want to do that, but how? Listen, there's, there's a myriad of ways, but ultimately it's not about work. It's not about programs. Ultimately, it's about relationship. And the best way I know, one of the best ways I know, is to get these words into your mouth every morning. So I'm going to write this. I, you know, my bathroom mirror is like the best reflection of Scripture on the planet. I write all kinds of things on my bathroom mirror. I'm going to write this on my bathroom mirror when I get home today in dry erase marker. Right here, Psalm 139, 23, and 24. That Scripture right there. Search me, God, and know my heart. Stop. Until that's in your spirit, don't keep going. Search me, God, and know my heart. And then, it takes me a long time to get ready. I don't know if you're one of those five-minute people. Eric Timchuk can get ready in three and a half seconds. I don't know how he does it. He just walks through the shower, and he's clean. And then he just, he's like, it's like the Jetsons. He goes on this little thing. If you're too young for the Jetsons, you can watch it on YouTube probably. And then he just, he just does this, and the clothes just get on him, and he's ready to go out the door. I haven't even gotten out of bed yet. Like, it takes me a good solid 30 minutes to get ready. I can pray this psalm lots of times in that 30 minutes. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Golly, I could stop there for all of January. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, where am I worried? Because when, when I read Philippians, it says that I shouldn't worry about anything, but instead I should pray about everything. I shouldn't be concerned about my life. I should go to you in relationship and talk to you about how my life is going so that you can give me peace, so that you can give me security. See if there's any offensive way in me, and surely it doesn't take long, and lead me. God, help me to leave all of those things behind. Help me to turn my head. Help me to shift my heart. Lead me in the way. The kind of thinking, the kind of living, the kind of relationships that will take me into ever lasting life. We need those metaphors, the bread of life, the true vine, to help us to understand just how much God wants to penetrate our souls and our lives. His thoughts about you are yes and amen. He wants to remain in you as you remain in him. He's able to keep you, he's able to bless you, he's able to use you, he's able to fulfill you, he is able to redeem every hair on your head. The question is, today in the face of that truth, today with all of those realities in front of us, just like the psalmist, how will we respond? Some people go, I'm not worthy, that's true. That's that's why it's called good news. Because you're not worthy, but you could be in a second. See, it's not by works that we're made worthy. It's by inviting him to have full control of our lives, surrendering our lives over to Christ, that we're made worthy. So you don't need to be worthy. You just need to surrender and say, there's no way I can do this. No way. That's the first step. That's why it's called good news. Good news wouldn't, if you'll just take the exam, and make over a 75, you can pass right into heaven. That's not good news, that's terrifying news. Good news is, listen, no, 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 it doesn't matter. Jesus already took the test. All you have to do is ask him, hey, can I come in? Hey, I wanna be in your house. Hey, I wanna be a part of what's going on. I'm tired of this way, I want your way. Invite him into your life today, and all of those things can be made new. And he will do for you more than you could ever ask, or imagine possible. In fact, in just a moment, he does it. In just a moment, you have every spiritual blessing in heaven available to you. 
the rest of our life, the struggle is just remain in me. That's why we do connect groups, because it's hard to do it alone. Like Nakiba said, everybody should have to do this. This should be a requirement of becoming a Christian, because it certainly feels like a requirement of staying a Christian. That's why we gather together like this, not just so that we can have something else to do on Sunday morning because we got tired of sleeping in. We got one day to sleep in and we were like, no, nah, I don't want to sleep in anymore. No, that's not why. It's because we know that this is the way God created us to live. It's another moment of surrender going, God, I want to sleep in, but I know the plans you have for me. So I'm going to do what you've asked me to do so I can discover all the good things you have for me. Come on, church. This 2024... I want you to write it down, because I'm telling you, if you'll do this by December, you will be a different person. You'll be leading a different life. Your hope will rise. Your confidence will rise. Your joy will rise. Your faith will rise. Your relationships will rise. Your kids will rise. Your marriage will rise. All of those things will rise. If you will grab a hold of this today, pray that prayer every morning, not with the words, but with the heart that says, God, I want to know you, you will experience the fullness of God in the land of the living. You just have to, you have to, you have to remain in him and he will make it happen. Come, let me pray for you real quick. Let's ask God to do this right now. Father, I thank you so much, God, for all that you've already done. God, I thank you for making this reality manifest in our lives. Help us to pray this every morning. Help us to invite you every day. Help us to stay on the path of righteousness for your namesake, God, and for the blessing and prosperity of every one of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, Pastor Tony, just come up here real quick. Hey, before we dismiss today, church, I want to make a little bit of announcement to you. You know, God has big plans for this church. That's right. And a part of that plan is we're connected to a much bigger organization. We're connected to C3 Global, over 600 churches around the world. Some of you would know that. Some of you wouldn't. About 25 of those churches reside in the USA, and about six of them reside in South America right now. And the, the leadership of the movement, Pastors Phil and Chris Pringle, have asked us to become the overseeing authority for all the churches in the U.S. and all the churches in South America. It's very exciting for us today. It's a big day. It's a big day because it's not just about us, although we feel super honored, but I want you to know that it's about you. We yes. want you to know that it's about you. You know, last year, I think one of the highlights that we had was getting to support C3 Kasese in Uganda with Pastor Rock, remember that? We helped build that church. Well, I want you to know what this means, the fact that we're overseers of North and South America. It means that we get to help build more churches in the Americas. And that doesn't mean that we're asking you to fund those. What I'm trying to explain to you is we can pray for them, we can support them. You're gonna start seeing people come in here and go, how do you guys do this? We wanna build a church like this. We've heard all about you. How do we do this? Let me talk to your kids director. Let me talk to your assimilations director. Like, help me. We as a church get to build North America and South America. It's a big day. Yeah, that's right. And, so, yeah, go ahead. And, and, and we've already been doing a lot of that. Yeah. And because of you, really, because of your faithfulness, because of your support, because of what you're doing, we are able to step into this place. In fact, already Angela and Hannah are talking to the churches in America about their kids' programs. Already Jesse and Andrew are inviting people to come into our youth ministry, see what we're doing, and be a, a source of hope and inspiration to them. Already Pastor Joe has worship leader after worship leader after worship leader calling or saying, hey, can we get connected so that I can hear about what you're doing and how we can lead other people into the presence of God like you're doing that. So, hey, I just wanna say thank you, church, because truly, you may not know it yet, but I'm telling you, you're going to have the opportunity to be a part of building this church movement around the globe. And I'll tell you, let me make this commitment to you just in case you're wondering. For Sonny and I, like C3 Atlanta is our absolute number one priority That's for right. the rest of our lives. That's right. But I think God's created in that opportunity, in that commitment, an yeah. overflow potential so that we can be a blessing to other people as well. So that's what we're gonna do. So it's exciting. So we are now, we, we. are an apostolic center where we can help people grow the kingdom. So right. can I just pray for all of us? Yeah. I think that would be a great moment because it's, again, it's not just us, it's all of us. So that's why right. don't you raise your hands? Lord, I thank, thank you Jesus. so much. Lord, we thank you together yes. that you have chosen C3 Atlanta, that you have chosen this church to build your kingdom, Lord. What an honor it is. So 
Lord, I thank you that you don't call people without qualifying them. And Lord, I thank you that even in this moment that you're doing something special. Lord, I pray that you would qualify every person that is sitting in this room. Lord, that we will have a hand in growing your kingdom. And Lord, we say yes, and we are excited about all you're going to do. Be glorified, be magnified, be lifted high. Lord, we are here to serve you. Thank you for all you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.